Brother Bob. Uh, unfortunately, I wasn't what you call under him, and I haven't even really, I don't guess, even heard him preach a message. But I have seen the message that you preached. The old saying is, you know, I'd rather see a message and hear one any day. Amen, and I have seen the message take effect upon the people here. And uh, so what I'm going to do is brag on the one that made Brother Bob what he is. Amen, because uh, like I said, I wasn't under Brother Bob, but I have been under the Lord Jesus Christ for many years. Amen, and I know that the same spirit that dwells in that man dwells in me. Is that right? And the same spirit that dwells in Brother Bob dwells in Brother Red. Amen. And so we all have different offices as to diversities of the spirit, but it's all the same spirit. Can somebody say hallelujah? Amen. And uh, I can look back at the ministry of William Branham and I can see that he blazed the trail. He blazed one, amen, and though I wasn't under him, Yet I'm under the one that was in Brother Branham. Hallelujah. I knew Brother George Leon Pike. Though I wasn't under him, yet I went under the very one that made him what he was. Somebody say hallelujah. So what we're all talking about, it's not Brother Bob that I love, but it's the Christ that dwells on the inside of you that I've fallen in love with. Because to be honest with you, if Christ wasn't in me, I probably wouldn't love Brother Bob. And if Christ wasn't in him, he probably wouldn't love me. Somebody say hallelujah. As a matter of fact, I'll tell you something else. If God hadn't drawn on my heart, I wouldn't have looked his way for five seconds. Neither would you. Amen. Because how many know you don't get up one morning and decide to be a Christian? Is that right? Somebody say hallelujah. Billy Graham says it's a choice. Brother, it's a birth. It's a born again experience when you make contact with that other world. It's when God calls you. He told the disciples, Jesus said, you didn't choose me. What did that mean? That mean if it was of their choice, they would not have followed him in the first place. Amen, but because he was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world, there had to be a people he was slain for. Amen. So therefore, when he ran across those disciples, he said, I remembered you. I remember you. You were the sons of God that was shouting in glory before the foundation was ever laid. And he come to redeem them that belonged to him. Man, somebody say praise the Lord. So Brother Bob, as I look across the audience, you draw a pretty good crowd to be 80 years old. So I want to propose a plan. Amen. That next weekend we'll celebrate your 80th and first week birthday. And we'll just keep on going until it reaches 81. And then we'll 81 in the first week. And all you folks just keep on coming. Somebody say hallelujah. <laughs> the Lord. I want to talk a little this morning. I know it's getting late and I won't hold you very long, Lord willing. But I want to talk this morning on the mechanics and the dynamics. And now, you know, let's look at the mechanic part for a little while. Now, we know that there's an automobile. Some man had put that automobile together. He had a knowledge, he had an understanding. And he put that automobile together. It's got the pistons, it's got the valves, it's got the transmission, it's got the starter, it's got the push rods, it's got everything in it that it's supposed to have. Somebody say hallelujah. And that man has put that together. The man that put it together is called a mechanic. Because he knows how that engine works. He knows if this part moves, it's going to move another part. But the trick is, is how to get that engine moving. Now the part that he don't have no control over is when you turn that ignition. And when you turn that ignition, 
a fire takes place, electricity there is take place, and it throws that motor in motion. Now that is the dynamics of that engine. Amen. And what we want to talk about this morning is the mechanics and the dynamics. Now how many know you've got to have both? If you've got the mechanics, that's good. But if you don't have the dynamics, the mechanics is no good. And how many knows that you can't have the dynamics without the mechanic? See, I remember a time, one time, that, that Israel was in a battle with the Philistines. And I remember there was Saul. He was a big man. He's a huge man, bigger than all the other folks. And that old giant come out there. Amen. So I dare any one of you to come out and take me on. Is that right? Well, there was Saul. He was the king. He was the leader. He was the big man. He was the preacher of the hour. Amen. But he did not step out. He said, other, he looked at his people. He said, is there anybody here that wants to go? Well, I wouldn't give five cents for a leader like that. Is that right? Hey, well, nobody was crazy. Why? He said, Saul, you're bigger than all of us. But he was small and compared to the giant. Scared. And he sat down. He said, I don't know what to do about this situation. Now, he had the mechanics. He had the sword. He had the shield. He had a whole nation behind him. But he lacked the dynamics. He lacked that something inside that could speak to him and said, Saul, pick up your sword and get out there. He lacked it. He didn't have it. Then all of a sudden, here comes a little shepherd boy along, bringing water, said, you boys are thirsty here. But he found them not thirsty because they ain't been fighting. And he looked out there, he said, who's that big mouth over there hollering? He was a boy. And he walked over there. He said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that dares to come against the army of the living God? And he stood there and said, come on, anybody, any three of us, come on. He looked over at Saul. He said, what are you going to do about this? You going to let him talk? He said, son, there's nothing we can do. I have, I have looked in the old scroll and none of the prophets ever talked about a situation like this. We don't know what to do. We can't do anything. Only thing I know to do is surrender. Now, I, he didn't say that, but I'm telling you, if you ain't doing anything, you're surrendering. <laughs> and David come along, he said, I'll take him. He said, son... Just a boy. Why, well, he said, you've never done anything in your life. He said, this man is a man of war. He has killed many a people. Why, well, he'll have your head for lunch. Mm -hmm. He said, well, I tell you what, Mr. King. He said, an old bear thought the same thing not too long ago. And I was keeping my father's sheep, and he come and tried to take them. I took care of him. And that old lion come along. He tried to do the same. I took care of him. He said, well, this old one circumcised be just like one of them. The old Saul said, all right, son, you got some guts about you. You got some gumption about you. And everybody began up, yeah, oh, David, come on. Come on, David, you can do it. The old Saul said, let me tell you what, let me take my, let my armor off, I'll let you have it. He said, no, sir, you keep that armor. I haven't tried that armor. I don't know what that's made of. He said, well, what have you tried? He said, I stood in the name of the Jehovah God of Israel. I have stood in his name. I stood in his authority. And I've seen what he can do. You know, I thought the same thing, Brother Red. Coming up, and I tried on the Pentecostal holiness garment for a little while. I tried on the Assemblies of God garment for a little while. But I found out that the devil's not scared of that. <laughs> Satan ain't scared of that. But the only thing that I have found to work is when I stand in the name of Jesus Christ. Yeah. 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 Little David.
David said, I'm going to do something. You keep that armor. I've got my little slingshot. Let me find me some stones, five smooth stones, and let me take it out there, and I'll show you what the great Jehovah Yahweh can do when a man stands for it. He went out there, and old giant said, well, look here. Oh, big mighty Israel sends a boy out to fight me. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. Old David, all the time pulling them little stones out in position. There you go. He said, you coming, you coming to me with a slingshot and a stone? He said, son, I'll feed your head to the birds. Mm-hmm. At that time, he's done loaded up. He said, come on. Right here's my head. He said, I'll take your own sword and cut your head off. Oh, yeah, boy, that made him mad. He said, here we go. He said, he pulled it back. Now, David had the mechanics. He had his slingshot. He had his stone. He had guts. He had boldness. He had his faith. Hallelujah. He had confidence in God. Now, all he had to have was the dynamics to come into picture. And when he swung it back, the dynamics took that stone and hit that giant between the eyes. See, he brought the mechanics and the dynamics together. See, today we're trained in church. We know how to come and sit on a pew. We know how to raise our hands. We know how to sing our songs. We know how to play our instruments. We know how to testify. We know how to tell our funny stories. Somebody say hallelujah. But let me tell you something, my friends. When you come to church and you raise up holy hands and your heart begins to be enlarged and you begin to praise the almighty God, there's a dynamic, a spiritual inertia that takes place on the inside. See, it's that spiritual inertia that we can't explain that happens right in here. You can pray at the altar all you want to, but until you come with an unction of the Holy One and you bow down on them knees and your heart begins to talk and your spirit begins to submit into the hands of an almighty God, then that spiritual inertia begins to ignite you and the Holy Ghost and fire begins to come in you and you begin able to praise God. Hallelujah. No, not with corrupt hands, but with holy hands, with a pure heart and a pure mind and a pure spirit. But that's, when that's something that takes place, turn to Hebrews, the 11th chapter. Let's look at the old faith chapter. Brother Bob, I'm sure in your life, you have found some of the dynamics. I have. I know I have seen it. Hallelujah. Hebrews 11 and 1. Let's look at it for just a little bit. We have the mechanics. How do we get the dynamics? How do we have those two that comes together to ignite you from within that causes a fire to happen and gets your pistons rolling? Get your valves working right. Hallelujah. Where you can honestly stand before the God of heaven. How many knows it's Christ in you, the hope of glory? You know it? How many knows the only heaven there is is spirit? Is that right? Somebody said, Brother Carlos, one day we'll go up and we'll see God. You'll never find him up there. Naphtha's has already been there. They, they're going in the wrong direction. Hallelujah. Jesus said, I'm going away, but one day I'm coming back to you again. He said, the world won't see me, but you'll see me because I'll be within you. It's gonna take those dynamics to get you in heaven. It's gonna take the dynamics 
to get you what we call rapture. It's that dynamic to get you resurrected. It's going to take that dynamic to get you in the millennium. It's going to take that dynamic to get you to love your brother and your sister. It's going to take that dynamic to get you to be holy before God. Our forefathers has walked. I told you the story of David. Let's look at some other stories here. How it began to happen. I want you to look at this first verse. And I want you to remember this verse. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. You remember that verse. Through faith we understand that the worlds, S the worlds, were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, and God testifying of his gifts, and by it being dead, yet he speaketh. You see, Abel had a revelation that life was in the blood. He had a revelation of that. Cain did not. Cain brought a fleshly offering. See, when we come to church, when we come to this building, how many knows this is not the house of God? You're the house of God. Amen. God dwells in that little place right there. Amen. When you come here, amen, you cannot bring a natural offering. In other words, your thoughts cannot be natural in the presence of God. You're the Bible says the carnal mind is the enmity of God. It is your enemy. He said, let no flesh glory in my presence. Amen. He don't want your thoughts. He don't want your theology. He don't want what you think about things or what kind of doctrines you believe in, what you have mustered up, what you have conjured up, what your grandma taught or what your grandpa taught, what your daddy taught, what your mama taught. He wants the present day truth. And he wants all those thoughts to be pure and holy and righteous in his presence. Brother, when we bring those things together, the dynamics will be there and your body will be healed. Your financial problems will be over. And when those things comes together, you won't have to listen for a trumpet to sound. The dynamics will teach you that that trumpet is sounding right now. By faith, Enoch was translated, I like that one, that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. I said that he pleased God. And when he saw that, Enoch had a revelation. Enoch had a revelation that if I please God, I don't have to live on the earth. Come on, somebody. He was able to look and see Calvary. He had the same revelation that Abel had. Walking along there. Let me tell you, folks. If you're waiting to be translated, you're missing it. The Bible says, God said, he hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. What are we waiting on? What are we doing? How are we thinking? I can't die no more than God can die. Neither can you. The Bible says in God there is no death nor darkness. No stumblings. No nothing. All light. When he, now, let me bring you out something here for a minute. I know it's getting late. Hold on. I can smell the food myself. Now, and Enoch, see, when you understand that God has to give you eternal life, you don't have it. 
If you had eternal life, he wouldn't have to give it to you. But he's not come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. He said you die like men because you don't believe. Is that right? You can put me in the ground out there if you want to, brother. I have bypassed the grave. <laughs> you can put me ten foot under, but I'm not dead. I'm alive forevermore. The Bible says hell hath enlarged itself. Right? We brought it out last weekend or a couple of weeks ago, whenever it was. Hell is a her. It's a religious system that holds the dead. The Bible says hell is so large it had to embroider, uh, it has gone coast to coast. It has just spread out, it's so large. Every denomination in the world is just spread out. They've got so many dead folks in them, they don't even know what to do with them anymore. Hallelujah. But there's a few that is chosen of God that wants the dynamics in their lives. And that has found that dynamic. And God has delivered me from the grave. Oh, I was, I was worse than old Lazarus. By the time of me, I was already stinking. Somebody say hallelujah. But he called me by name and said, I'm forth. Somebody say hallelujah. Hallelujah. I can't die. I'm alive. If we can understand that, folks, amen, that Satan is a liar. Your intellectual thoughts is a liar. Your body is a lie. God is alive, and I'm part of that body. One thing he did not say, he did not say I'm part of your body. But he said you're a bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Is that right? God lives within the body, but he don't live in the flesh. Somebody say hallelujah. Because Paul said there's not one good thing in my flesh. So God lives within the body. Right here, right in this man. Hallelujah. See, we have found the dynamics. We put the mechanics with it. We know how to pray. We know how to raise our hands. We know how to say, thank you, Jesus. Glorify your God. Amen. We know how to quote scriptures. We know how to sing our songs. Hallelujah. But there's a few that's able to put the dynamics with it and a spark begins to happen on the inside. And the transition of life begins to take place because of that spiritual inertia. Something takes place. You just have to turn the key. Jesus, what did he say? I have the keys of death, hell, and the grave. You know what a key is? A revelation. I've got the revelation of what death is. It ain't out there under the ground. To be carnally minded is death. I've got a revelation. He said, I've got the keys to hell. I know what it It ain't a flaming pit out there somewhere. It's a religious system that teaches you how to die. Death is a knowledge. You've got to be taught how to die. Amen. Come on, somebody. a little more here by faith Abraham now listen you know Noah or uh, Enoch the Bible says was the seventh from Adam right the Bible says when Jesus came he was the second man Adam but there were seven church ages and in that seventh church age the seventh from the second man Adam was a revelation that came forth that says you do not have to die. A revelation came forth. Somebody say hallelujah. <laughs> Brother Branham began to preach. Somebody said, Brother Cole, you believe he was the seventh church age messenger? I don't know. But I know one thing. I believe what he said on this issue. He said you do not have to die. That's what he said and I believe that. The seventh from the Adam. The seventh from the second man Adam. Showing that Enoch that that seven church age would get that revelation and they would be found not because God took them. Did you know you're hid from the world? 
You're hid from the world. They don't know who I am. They think I'm Brother Carlos Carter. They don't know that I'm part of the body of Christ. I'm hid from them. They don't know who you are. You're hid from them. And God planned that that way. We just don't understand who we are. We don't understand because, see, we've got the mechanics. We still got it in our brains. Brother Carlos, one day Gabriel's going to step out, or Michael, whoever you think it is, going to step out. Do, 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 do. Here we go. Here we go. Bless you, Lord. I'll give you, thus saith the Lord, it'll never be that way. Last Trump is a message. It is a message that will call you up to where he's at. Come up hither, John. John, come up hither and I'll show you things that must be hereafter. He came down to man once in the form of Jesus, but now in the form of the Christ, he calls you to where he's at. Amen. See? It's not the word made flesh now. It's the word made spirit. God don't dwell in the flesh anymore. Paul said, I once knew Christ after the flesh, but no more do I know him after the flesh. When Peter denied Jesus, he said, I know not the man. Wonderful, glorious thing. Paul said the same thing when he came along. He said, I once knew Christ after the flesh, but no more do I know him after the flesh. He said, I don't know the man. I don't know the man either. I don't know the Jesus that walked the shores of Galilee. Jesus said, don't, don't look at me, I'm not good. There's only one good, and that's the Father that dwells. I'm a son just like you are. It condemned Peter when he said it, but Paul got a revelation and it didn't condemn him when he said it. Neither am I condemned when I say I know not the man. Oh, that little damsel might come after you one day and that's that religious system, that woman, that harlot might come after you and say, you're one of them, ain't you? I can say I don't know the man. Bless you. But I know the Christ. Hallelujah. See, the mechanics is the Jesus, but the Christ is the dynamics. The natural word is the mechanics. That's went forth through all the world and, and it brought forth God's great salvation plan. Amen. But there comes a time when there's got to be a winning of the veil. There comes a time when you've got to separate the Jesus from the Christ. Remember a few weeks ago, and I was preaching. I said, Jesus is the mark of the beast. And then I turned, I said, Satan will come after me for that. Remember I told you that? He did. He did. But I met him with the dynamics. <laughs> Hallelujah. Because I have no condemnation. I have no condemnation because I walk in the spirit and not after the flesh. The Bible says the whole world wandered after the beast. It's that Jesus that they're looking for. It's that natural body that they want to reach out and touch. Oh, there he is. Hallelujah. And he says, I've been with you all this time. I've talked with you. you become part of me. I've blessed you. I've caused you to sing your songs. I've shouted in you. And you still don't know me. It's unbelievable. It is unbelievable. A man said one time, he was a Trinitarian. He believed in Father, Son, Holy Ghost. That's all right. He said, boy, he's in church. We had a move of God like you ain't never seen. People shouting. A brother was with me. He said, uh, which one of them moved on you? 
He said, well, what do you mean? He said, you said there's three of them. I'd like to know which one moved on you, called you south. Well, he said, I, he said, well, like, there's, there's no way to tell it. He said, no, there's not. Because, see, it's only one. It's Christ. It's God. It's the great Yahweh, the Jehovah, the Jesus. In one way, and that's through the Lord Jesus Christ. So Mohammed can take the height, beauty, get lost. Krishna, see you later. Come too late to tell me any different. So you see, when Jesus came and he was preaching, and you know Abraham back there, the Lord told him, said, Abraham, get up out of your country. Get up out of your country and get out of here. I'm going to bless you. He said, okay. He got his stuff ready. Fixing to go. God said, Abraham, I want you to do something for me. Anything, Lord, anything. One time, I want you to take your firstborn son. I want you to take him up on the mountain. Sacrifice him to me. He said, I'll get the wood. He piled it all together. He said, come on, son, we got to go. Where are we going now? We got to go to the top of the mountain. We got to sacrifice to the Lord. He says, daddy, what, where's the sacrifice? He said, the Lord will provide. He said, I and my lad will return to you in a little while. Now, Abraham, Brother Green, had the mechanics. He got the wood. He got his faith, and off he went. That's right. He popped it down. He said, son, tied him up there and tied him up. Oh, he could have been crying. Somebody said, what kind of God would do that? Just stole him. God knows what he's doing. Amen. He said, son, he said, daddy, why? What have I done? Haven't I done everything you wanted me to do? Haven't I kept it? He said, you've done. You've been perfect. That's why you're the sacrifice. You're perfect. And just lay there. He took the knife and a voice. I'm telling you, he would have struck that kid. He would have killed him. You know why? Because Abraham had some dynamics in him. And he knew that God, even though he would slay his son, but he said that was the promised seed. And he knew that God would raise him from the dead. Amen. He had some dynamics about him. And those dynamics has affected you and you and you and me. Centuries ago, decades ago, and yet what he did is affecting me and you today. Oh my. What have I done to affect somebody else? Not in a negative way, but I'm talking about what have I done to affect you in a positive way? So when the gospel began to come forth, Jesus began to minister. He said, he looked at his disciples. He said, I want you to remember one thing, Brother Red, he told them. That which is born of flesh is flesh. But that which is born of spirit, spirit. The Bible says, he that is joined to a harlot is one flesh. But he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. See, God don't look at you as flesh and blood. He looks at you if you're born again, if you're walking in the presence, amen, if that spiritual nursing has taken place on the inside of you, you are a bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. You're his body. You're the very body that he has always wanted to dwell in. David tried to build him a house. He couldn't do it. Solomon built him a mansion. He said, but I'm God. Heaven's my throne. Earth is my footstool. What house shall you build me? Oh, but you are the one. You are the house that he wanted to dwell in. See, when Jesus came preaching, he was the house of God. But he said, in my father's house are many mansions. Many mansions. He said, I'm going away. I to prepare that revelation for you and when I come back you can move into your mansion. Somebody
somebody say hallelujah. See, we keep waiting on things to take place and things to happen. But if we can understand, that's only the mechanics. What you're looking at is only the mechanics. But when the mechanics and the dynamics comes together, it creates a rapture. It creates a resurrection. It creates a millennium. It creates a mansion for you to live in. Somebody say hallelujah. See, we got to have some dynamics. got to have it. It's got to go from that dead letter over to the words of spirit and life. That's the resurrection. When we talk about the resurrection, we're talking about two men, Adam and Jesus. First man, Adam, made a living soul. Second man, Adam, made a quickening spirit. Is that right? Paul said it's not that which first was spiritual, but that which first was natural, then that which was spiritual. Talking about Adam, talking about Jesus. We're either in one of them. If you're in Adam, you die. If you're in Christ, you shall be made alive. See, we enter into a resurrection. Not a personal resurrection of the body, but we enter into a resurrection. There at the tomb of Lazarus, Mary said, oh, if you'd have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And Martha, he said, Martha, I am the resurrection. See, the resurrection is not an event. It's a person called Christ. It's not an event. But see, we got to get out of the beast mind. We got to get out of the thinking of the intellectual thoughts of a trumpet sounding and a, and a Jesus with hands and legs appearing out from the heavens. Jesus, when he was taken away, disciples looking upon him, what does the scripture say? In like manner, as he was taken away, so shall he return. Right? And the Bible says, a cloud received him out of their sight. Now, where did he go? Just above their thinking. Just above their thinking. That's all it was. Paul said, we're surrounded with such a great cloud of witnesses. See, Christ appeared on the cloud and came back in the cloud just like he said he would. I wish somebody say hallelujah. The body absolutely has nothing to do with it. All right, let's look at this. Now remember, I want you to read that first verse. I'm closing. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Is that right? Now let's look over here at the 39th verse of chapter 11 of Hebrews. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God having provided some better thing for us that they without us should not be made perfect. Brother, they was the mechanics, but we are the dynamics. We are the coming of the Lord. We are the trumpet sounding. We are the resurrection, and we are the millennium. They preached about it, but they did not receive the promise. But the promise was unto them that are called of God, filled with the Holy Ghost, and as many as the Lord our God shall call. The promise is unto us. We are the dynamics because we believe their report and our spiritual ignition has taken place on the inside. It got the engine running. And we'll never run out of gas. Somebody say hallelujah. It says, and God having provided some better thing for us. So chapter one, verse one of chapter 11. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And I'm telling you that this day, that scripture is fulfilled because I don't hope, I have the evidence of everything that I've ever hoped for.
I got the evidence. Faith is my substance. I've heard the trumpet. I've seen the Christ return. I've seen the resurrection. I'm walking in the millennium. Somebody say hallelujah. I am. The Bible says uh, Jesus is preaching. He said Abraham was looking for a city that had foundations. And then the next thing he said was so astounding that Abraham saw my day and rejoiced. Because you're that city that sit on the hill that Abraham has searched for. And we have foundation. It ain't made of brick and mortar and stone. But the Bible says that the holy of prophets and prophets and apostles is our foundation. Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. So see, we are that city of the living God, right? Why? Because we are the manifestation of what they preach. We are the evidence that makes them perfect by saying that their testimony is true. Hallelujah. Oh, Isaiah said great would be his rest when he comes. Great would be his peace when he comes. Amen, because he's the prince of peace. Somebody said, how do you know it was him? How do you know he was the one? Let me see it. I brought it out here before. Last comment, and I'm closing. I'll give you my word. <laughs> he don't believe it. <laughs> when Peter came to Jesus and said, Lord, how many times do I forgive my brother? Seventy times? He said, try seventy times seven, which is how many? Four ninety. He said, 490 years given to my people. To do what? To bring in everlasting righteousness. <laughs> Amen, to bring in and make uh, an end of sin. Somebody say hallelujah. The Bible says Jesus condemns sin in the flesh. Isn't that what he done? And to anoint the most holy. We ain't waiting out there in the future. We've anointed him, king of kings, lord of lords. He's brought in righteousness. We become the righteousness of almighty God. Become that righteousness. We become the holiness. And we have tagged him King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Remember one thing. The Bible says every knee shall bow. Every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That don't mean the sinner out here. I don't want them bowing. He's not their Lord. Jesus, Paul said the only way that you can call Jesus Lord is by the Holy Ghost. But he wants his elect, his called and chosen ones that comes to church every morning, that raises your hands and praises him. Amen. And feel that Holy Spirit moving on the inside. He loves to hear it when you say, King of kings and Lord of lords, I bow myself down before thee because you're my Lord. That's what he wants. He'll kill the world. He'll destroy it. But he wants you to live. He ain't interested in the world. The Bible says, now wait a minute, Brother Carlos. The Bible says God so loved the world. Really? That's what it says. Let me ask you something. But he told you if you love the world... He said, the love of the Father ain't in you. Would God love something and then tell you not to love it? The world he died for is what was in the beginning. <laughs> when he had fellowship with Adam. When he walked. Come on, folks. When he walked in the cool of the day. How did he fellowship with Adam? Through his spirit. How does he fellowship with you? See, God is a spirit. He fellowship, he comes walking through you through the cool of the day. Says, hello, Bob, my servant. You've been with me for many years. How you doing today? Huh? There's no God with arms and legs. He's in there. 
And he wants to fellowship you from within. Is that right? So you can get your mind off of that flesh and bone body. That ain't what I'm looking for. I'm looking for the God that was in him. That's what he told me to look for. That's what I'm looking for. You know, it takes away people's hope. It seems like when you make a statement like that, it's, they just, oh. you mean, I'm not going to and touch his fingers and his toes and his hands. I'm not going to. No, he doesn't have that. He's changed. If he constantly had the nail-scarred hands, that would be a total reminder of your sins every day. He don't want you to be reminded of that. Your sins are wiped away. Your sins are no more. You are sinless before God. Oh, come on, folks. You are sinless. I want to see him in his character. I want to see him how he is, what he looks like inside. I... Look, all preachers know we size each other up when we meet you. You better believe I size you up. I want to know what's on the inside. You size me up. If you love me, you love me for who I am on the inside with Christ. You don't love me for my outward appearance. You don't love me for that. I don't love you for that. If I knew you after the flesh, I wouldn't even like you. And you wouldn't like me. Well, I couldn't stand Brother Greg if I knew him after the flesh. That old scoundrel. I wouldn't be around half of you folks. You wouldn't be around me. Because you wouldn't like me because I'm going to offend you some way or another. But on the inside is a God, the creator of heaven and earth. And my spirit has been intertwined with his spirit. And the dynamics is taking place. Oh, Paul said, I'm changing from glory to glory. Is that right? Oh, he might have been humped over. He might have been walking like this. I don't know what kind of condition he was. He might have been walking on a stick. But he said, I am changing from glory to glory to glory. From one revelation to another revelation. I'm becoming more and more like almighty God. See, it's not according. If God is according to the flesh, is he tall like this, brother? Is he fat like? I wasn't going to say that, but you said, is he fat like this man? Is he ugly like me? Does he got hair? Does he not have hair? Now that he believed. He believed that statement, see? I don't blame him. But nevertheless, see, I can't get an image. I don't know what he looks like then. But I got to know him after his character that's in this book. I know he loves me from his word. I know he adores me because of his word. I know he wants to heal me because of his word. I have seen his character. And the Bible says no man can look upon God and live. And when I saw him, I died. But when you get a glimpse of this and you get a glimpse of what God really is, friend, you won't come in his presence except through humility, except through crawling, and say, God, have mercy on my soul. When you see him, you'll do that. Hallelujah. Somebody say, I love Jesus. Let's stand to our feet. Hallelujah. God is good. God is great. I love him for who he is. You need prayer for anything, just come on up. Maybe you need the dynamic.